Li Shangjing, Untitled. Phoenix tail silk, so fragrant and delicate. Deep at night she sews a green bed curtain. Her moon-shaped fan could not conceal her shame as his carriage thundered off with no pledge spoken. Alone once more she watches the candle's gold grow dim. No word came, pomegranate wine remains unpoured. Somewhere his piebald horse is tied to a weeping willow. Where can she find an obliging southwest wind? We continue with yet another example of uh, Li Shangjing's septasyllabic regulated poems. This is the ninth and the one before last. As many of the poems in the series, it's about love, and as many of the poems in this series, it is untitled. But there is a clear change, at least in one important aspect in this poem, uh, that being the assumed poetic persona. So in the previous poems, this poetic persona was basically, or at least I basically assumed it to be a man longing for a woman. But in this one, there's a very clear reversal of roles. Here it's very clearly a woman who is missing a man. So uh, a brief paraphrase of this poem could be that after having spent a night with her lover, um, this man leaves the woman and uh, he makes no pledges of any date at which she will come back, or any um, promises of marriage, which nevertheless the lady is implicitly expecting. And the whole of the poem turns around this frustrating encounter and this frustration of the woman at the lack of those prospects of a long-term relationship, of a marriage relationship with the loved man becoming a reality. So you could say it's a woman's complaint at being abandoned, and at the man not satisfying what were the woman's expectations and perhaps the man's promises when this liaison was first started. Now, the poem is pretty straightforward. There are some, as usual, oblique uh, literary and cultural references embedded in it, although, as, uh, as opposed to some other cases, I don't think a light skipping of these or a light awareness of these I don't think it would seriously hamper the appreciation of, of this poem. So, very typical Chinese poem. Uh, a lot of the poems of the scholar officials are placed in the mouths of female persona, and this is a tradition that comes of old. And scholar officials had no problem with this. Um, in fact, a female poetic persona it's quite ubiquitous in poems of Chinese scholar officials where the man, well, well, the apparent setting of the poem is a love relationship between a man and a woman and the woman complaining. But in these poems, it's very easy to interpret the woman as the scholar official and the man as the ruler, as the emperor. After all, the emperor was pure yang and the ministers were expected to be bending and flexible towards him. That is jin, just like women are expected to be jin and men are expected to be yang in the traditional correlative and metaphysical thought of ancient China. Okay, after this introduction then, let's go, as usual, and take a look at each of the couplets. First couplet. Phoenix tail silk, so fragrant and delicate. Deep at night she sews a green bed curtain. So, as, as, as with many of these poems, we get like this luxurious setting and a woman surrounded by luxurious and expensive um, objects. So the poem starts with an image of phoenix tail silk, which must have been, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think it was one variety of expensive and high quality silk. So silk starts in the first plane, this roll of phoenix tail silk, which is not only delicate, it's fragrant, it smells nice. What's this silk doing? The second line clarifies it. Deep at night, she sews a green bed curtain. So there is a woman wakeful at night, so she can't sleep for some reason or other. We might presuppose that it will be longing for the beloved. 
and she's awake at night sewing uh, green bed curtains, probably green bed curtains that would have been part of the of 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 of, of the elements that a married woman would 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 take with her to her married house and uh, part of the um, the, uh, the 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 objects the implements uh, that a married woman is expected to make before marriage second uh, couplet her moon shaped fan could not conceal her shame as his carriage thundered off with no pledge spoken so the second couplet seems to be a flashback it jumps us back to a moment long before this sleepless night in which the woman is sewing the silk uh, to probably the memory of the last encounter, the last night spent together by man and woman. Uh, it's also focused, the second couple, through objects. In the first one, it was this silk for making bed curtains. In the second one, the two objects are a moon-shaped fan and a carriage. Of course, the carriage is the, is, is the object associated with a man, and it evidently represents, apart from a real... Um, transportation method that a scholar or official would have employed at the time, the movement, the parting, the going away. Uh, in her case, she uses the moon-shaped fan to conceal her shame. So the scene is, you know, she's ashamed at the fact that the man is leaving without making any pledges of coming back, and he's going away with his carriage. So the moon-shaped fan does seem to evoke undertones of literary uh, meaningfulness. Uh, there are probably quite a few anecdotes here, but the one that immediately comes to share to mind is Lady Pan. Lady Pan was one of the minor wives or concubines of uh, Hang Chengdi, an emperor of the Western Han Dynasty, uh, at the years uh, just before the beginning of our era. And uh, she was a very smart lady, apart from very beautiful and uh, very cultured, and she self consciously allowed herself to get out of the competition because there were at that time two court ladies, the Chao sisters, uh, who were very aggressively competing for the emperor's attention and killing uh, and getting rid of anybody uh, who, who interfered. Um, so, you know, she, she, she didn't protest when the emperor stopped visiting her, but she did compose a few poems uh, that were preserved, or, or at least uh, if, if they aren't hers, they were re-elaborations inspired on her story. Uh, and, and these poems included the image of, 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 of the, of the moon-shaped fan uh, associated with the woman. The idea is that a moon-shaped fan is used in summer when it's hot, but is discarded in autumn, just as the Lady Pan was discarded by the emperor after her period of uh, beauty and uh, seductiveness was over. Like Lady Pan, the unnamed lady of this poem, uses a moon-shaped fan, like it, uh, the lady is discarded, and she's using it unsuccessfully to conceal her shame. And when the moon has other associations, uh, there was a woman in the moon, so there might be a connection with the legends of the, the, the lady, Chang Ho, I think, the lady in the moon, and other things. But anyway, whatever the resonance is, the idea of the second couplet is clear. A sad, forlorn lady feels ashamed at her lover leaving her and not even making any promises that he could break of returning to spend the time with her or to marry her. Third couplet. So the third couplet puts us in the immediate aftermath of this departure. Alone, once more, she watches the candle's gold grow dim. No word came. Pomegranate wine remains unpoured. Um, we still have objects uh, focalizing our view in this poem, uh, and the two objects with connotations as well. So there's a, a candle in the first line of the couplet, and pomegranate wine in the second line. So all luxurious objects, we've got the candle's gold, a pomegranate wine, so luxurious objects of the inner quarters. The lady is alone. And alone she watches, she stays wakeful at night, just as at the beginning of the poem, watching as the candle is consumed, and the gold, the candle's gold, we might imagine the light that it emits, although maybe the candlestick is also made of gold or, or of some luxurious, shiny, burnished material. So she's watching as the candle goes down, and as the light becomes dim and non-existent. And time passes, 
No word comes from the, the beloved one. The pomegranate wine remains unpoured. Now, pomegranate wine is not just any wine. It seems it, it is the wine that would have been employed at a wedding banquet. So there might have been wine in the room or maybe a, uh, a glass of wine or, or a pitcher of wine is imagined to be in the room. But the idea is pretty clear. It's not just that this object is not used, it's that no marriage ceremony came to be or came to happen. Finally, the last sad concluding couplet seems to point at some of the reasons why the man is not coming back. Perhaps he is engaged in other liaisons and entertainments. Somewhere his piebald horse is tied to a weeping willow. Where can she find an obliging southwest wind? Uh, so the man is somewhere else. We don't know where, and uh, we can imagine that the poetic persona of the forlorn woman speculates about where this lover might be. Uh, the reference to a piebald horse being tied to a weeping willow, I think it's a reference to a poem, probably a ballad, of a, a man who tied his horse to a weeping willow and went into the pleasure quarters to enjoy the ladies. So... That's what the poetic persona might be suspecting. He is being entertained by other women, so he no longer thinks about me. And she sighs for an obliging southwest wind. This is probably another reference, one that I'm not quite aware of, but probably this obliging southwest wind would be a wind that unites lovers or that lets them mm, get together. So, all in all, pretty conventional poem in its type. Um, but uh, quite, quite, quite easy to read and imbued with that pathos, with that sadness of the forlorn woman abandoned by a man in a luxurious um, or relatively luxurious setting, which is a staple fare of previous poetry before the time of the Kung Tzishi, the palace style poetry of the Six Dynasties, and which would also become rather a staple fare in the early northern uh, northern Sung dynasty that would follow the Tang after a short period of, of, of chaos, when the new genre of the Tzu in its beginnings would focus on exactly this sort of thing, of themes and scenes of a, a lady in a boudoir uh, with intense love, feelings and longings.